All right, so we are looking at the uh, the final few letters in uh, in the New Testament. <clears throat> so the first one we're going to look at is uh, is the book of Hebrews. Now Hebrews is um, it's a little bit of a strange book. There are some uh, unusual concepts. There's some uh, complex use of symbols, but there is one. Uh, sustained one detailed argument that uh, that kind of fits throughout the whole book. Uh, this book also has um, quite outstanding language. So if if we're looking at um, kind of the the Greek language uh, amongst the the writings of the New Testament, uh, Hebrews, uh, the the Hebrews employs the one of the finest literary uh, uses of the Greek language, meaning the person who wrote it uh, really understood the Greek language, uh, really understood how to how to write in a very um, thought provoking, very insightful way. So this person was very very well educated, right? So it wasn't it wasn't kind of just a, a hack hack job of a letter. The person who wrote this really was an educated uh, person. Now, <clears throat> who is this person? There are actually quite a lot of unknowns about Hebrews. We don't know who the author is. It is um, uh, uh, anonymous. Uh, we don't know who it's written for. We don't know the addressees. We don't really know its origins, right? And we actually, we're not exactly sure when it was written. So one suggestion that I heard of was it was written sometime between 60 and 90 AD or before that uh, or after that. So really, we don't know um, much about, about this book uh, as well. Um, it is written as a, a letter, but if you kind of read through and dissect it, 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 it seems to be more like a sermon as well. So uh, it's, yeah, it, it kind of dips its feet into both areas, both genres. It's a letter and it's also uh, a sermon. Now, with regard to author, there, are, there have been some suggestions, right? Uh, the early tradition, the early, uh, earlier kind of, earlier of Christian history, uh, assume that it was written by Paul, and that's why it was included into uh, into the, the the New Testament uh, canon, the New Testament book. Now, some people now uh, I think most scholars recognize that no, this is uh, ninety nine point nine percent. They're sure it's not written uh, by Paul, right? But um, somehow the the author heard the gospel by those who heard. The Lord, right? So the you know it's pretty sure it's not it's not Paul. Now uh, we have it in the New Testament. This could probably be considered a a blessed mistake, right? So, but we do have it in the New Testament. It's not it's it's not a heretical book by any means. Um, uh, if it was Paul, Paul would usually uh, identify himself in the letter, and the author of Hebrews doesn't. And also the style of Hebrews is very, very different uh, from Paul. So there have been some other guesses. Uh, one guess would be uh, Apollos. Now you can read about him in Acts 18. Uh, Apollos was a Jew uh, who was converted to, um, to Christianity. And he was, he was quite well educated. He was, he was a very good speaker. Um, he knew the scriptures. And so uh, he could argue for Jesus Christ, for for the case, um, the case for Christ, uh, quite well. He was very eloquent. So, he, so he was. Um, a lot of people think that he is the one who wrote it, and and very well. You know, with his background, he could probably have written something like Hebrews. Another suggestion is uh, possibly Barnabas. Um, <clears throat> uh, he he traveled around with with uh, with Paul. He was, you know, in. He was a prominent um, kind of church worker, church leader. 
so maybe we don't know. Um, Apollos is probably uh, more more likely than uh, than Barnabas. And then there's also a, a suggestion that perhaps Priscilla, Priscilla and uh, her husband, they were uh, they were um, they were this couple who worked quite closely with Paul uh, uh, in in uh, in ministry. So the reason why Priscilla is brought up, uh, one theory is that because Hebrews is anonymous, right? Uh, if it was written by a woman, and if Priscilla had, let's say it's her, and she put her name on it, uh, a lot of people wouldn't, probably wouldn't take uh, the letter very seriously, especially Jewish people who, who you know, it, it seems to try to convince. Uh, the letter tries to tries to convince Jewish people of, of the the supremacy of of Jesus Christ. So uh, a woman writing that letter wouldn't have been taken very seriously, and hence uh, perhaps it's anonymous because uh, she didn't want to identify herself. So that that's an interesting interesting theory, um, one that you know it's 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 interesting to entertain. So, but again, we're not we're not sure who uh, who wrote it or to whom. So, uh, just kind of we'll just kind of leave it there. Now, what is going on in Hebrews? So, Hebrews uh, talks about a few different things. One, it talks about the superiority of Christ. Okay, um, Christ is above uh, above you know all the prophets. Of the past, the church fathers, um, there is no one greater than Christ, right? and therefore we need to listen to Christ. We need to follow Christ. Okay, so the superiority of Christ. Uh, it also address addresses, um, sorry, the 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 addressees, the 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 people that are that this letter is written to. Uh, they're facing a time of considerable difficulty and crisis. So. Uh, possibly they're facing persecution. Okay? We know in the first century there are, there have been uh, several instances where Christians uh, were being persecuted. Right? So this probably addresses one of those times. Uh, but um, with the persecutions, often that would result in these Christians uh, publicly renouncing Christ public, publicly, uh, in a sense, giving up their faith. So the addressees in 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 uh, in Hebrews uh, were facing that kind of thing, right? So it addresses that. Um, there's the consequences of returning to their former ways of worship that have less suffering. So you can imagine. You know, being a Christian actually was a very high cost. You know, you would it, it might cost you a lot of uh, a lot of suffering. It might cost your family a lot of suffering. All right, so, so to to not be a, a Christian is is safer. It's less less painful. All right, so um, Hebrews addresses that. You know, to to go back to your former ways is to abandon God entirely. It's uh, to go back is again to crucify Christ. So Hebrews says, "Put your trust in in Christ. He's our champion. He's our high priest. Uh, he also suffered. Right? He's the author and finisher of your faith. He intercedes for us and he understands uh, our weaknesses." And so it's, it's a very encouraging uh, book, uh, especially when you're facing a lot of difficulty. So uh, here's this is kind of the this is the um, the structure outline. You can see uh, Christ's supremacy, uh, the supremacy of God over previous revelation, over Moses, over Joshua, over Aaron, uh, and then there's the exhortation to pers uh, to persevere. Okay. All right, then we come to the book of James. Now, many people find James to be a very practical book about how to live live out the gospel. Martin Luther, he's the uh, the father of the Protestant Reformation. 
he didn't like this book very much. Um, he, uh, yeah, two for two reasons. First of all, this book doesn't, it didn't really talk much about Christ. Right. And secondly, it seemed to contradict Paul's teaching on righteousness by faith. Right. Paul, Paul is very much, you know, uh, we are justified by faith. And that's one of his emphasis. And, and uh, if you look at James, James is a very practical book about how to live out uh, the gospel. And so there's a section in there about, about works, right? Where faith uh, is evidenced by works. And so he, he, he found that as a contradiction to Paul. And so that's why Martin Luther kind of rejected uh, the book of James. Now, it is very practical. Um, we're not sure who the intended, intended addressees were. Uh, perhaps no one in particular. The style presents itself as a, a kind of a synagogue sermon. Uh, it's possibly notes from several sermons put together. But uh, we do have some uh, important key themes there. Uh, in the book, there's the interrelatedness of uh, testing, and wisdom and speech and actions, okay? Wisdom as the basis of right speech, uh, which leads to the right use of money. Uh, wisdom is learned in, in the midst of suffering. And then this idea of faith and works uh, together. Now, um, I think we, we understand that there is no contradiction between James and Paul's justification uh, by faith. Um, faith, for Paul, it's, it means to trust in Jesus, right? Simply that, you trust in Jesus, and, uh, you know, that that's all you need for righteousness. Now, for James, uh, a faith, what faith does is it produces Christ-like faith, okay? Or a Christ-like life. So faith that doesn't produce Christ-likeness it's just, it's just lip service. So really, Paul and James are talking about two different things. They're not talking about the same thing. So there, that's why I say there is uh, there is no contradiction. Uh, when it comes to works, for Paul, uh, works has to do with um, uh, following the, the or observing the Torah, obedience to the Torah, things like circumcision, food laws, um, you know, clean, how you how you maintain purity, uh, that kind of stuff, stuff that we find in, in the Torah uh, as, a, as, as a way of maintaining a relationship with God. So that, that's, that's what for Paul works is. Okay? It's about o obeying the Torah. Uh, for James, uh, works is nothing to do with that. Works is the actions of genuine faith, which is uh, which, which really Paul does expect anyway. From those who belong to Christ, okay. Paul expects uh, if if you really have a relationship with with God, that will uh, that will reveal itself through a Christ like life. So they're very much uh, Paul and James are very much um, they're very much uh, talking about the same thing, really. Okay, so they're yeah they're talking about two separate things, but they're talking about the same things. Uh, with in terms of justification for Paul, Paul uh, it means standing right before God. For James, it's a matter of you know whether or not one's uh, one's faith is genuine. Okay, so this is a this is a great book to study for uh, you know if, if 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 you want some if you're kind of more practical minded. There's a lot of practical uh, suggestions, practical uh, encouragements to living out your faith. Uh, then we come to Peter. Now, Peter, uh, this letter was written when persecutions uh, against Christians uh, were beginning. Uh, there are no deaths yet, uh, but the persecutions were, were beginning. It was written to the churches in five provinces of Asia Minor and to, uh, to Gentiles. Uh, some of the key ideas uh, are that, well, it's important how we live uh, in the world because the world does watch us. Especially if they know we are Christians, they will watch how we live, how we respond to uh, to different uh, 
challenges. Uh, Christ has suffered to redeem us. And the fact that we may also be called to suffer as we are called to act as his uh, his priests. So I think that's, that's one of the things um, that I think we as Christians need to understand as well, that uh, suffering uh, is or persecution even is a part of the Christian life. So, you know, we, we, we can't expect to be a Christian and necessarily expect a, you know, very cushy life that everyone will accept what we, what we say and what we do. All right. So persecutions, rejection, that kind of stuff. It's, it's, we need to expect that at some point in our lives. Okay. Um, by our conduct, we make our suffering redemptive for a hostile, uh, hostile word uh, world. So really, that I, I, that just means that our, our our suffering sometimes is for the sake of others, right? We 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 can be called to put ourselves in in places where you know it, it cost us something, but for the sake of showing love to others for the sake of redeeming uh, others for the sake of even um, helping uh, helping others right and then when it comes to suffering we suffer with joy uh, since just as Christ was raised to glory uh, we will also be raised uh, to glory so very much an, uh, encouragement uh, by Peter and uh, just an awareness that as Christians we may be called to suffer. Now, Peter, uh, he writes a second letter. Now, the second letter has to do with um, combating possible loss of faith uh, in the face of false teachers, uh, denial of the second coming. Right. So again, we have this, this theme, I think, similar to what Paul uh, faced as well, these false teachers. So uh, this has to do with the second coming, that Jesus Christ is coming back someday. Uh, so Peter's warning, uh, warning that there's a danger if we forget about the second coming, a right? danger of being too comfortable today where uh, where God has to compete with what we have. And this is very much um, very relevant to to the modern day of you know Christians being too comfortable you know with 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 what we have that we we essentially don't realize that we are uh, that we're worshiping God, uh, worshiping, idols or turning turning our faith away from god right so we need to uh keep our hearts on heaven and continue to pray come uh lord jesus All right so very short letter but a, an important reminder for us and then uh the letters of john these are very short letters First John is actually the longest. Second and third are very, very short letters. So with First John, uh, he has several concerns related to false teachers. Um, these false teachers, they uh, they denied that Jesus was the Christ or the Son of God. Uh, they rejected the incarnation, meaning they rejected that, uh, or some, yeah, I'll say some, not all. Uh, some rejected the the incarnation that Jesus came as a human being. Okay. So if they believe that Jesus was God, uh, there was no way that God would become a human being, right? Because God is God. God it needs to be is separate from uh, from from humanity. But what they believed is is, is that uh, this kind of what, what I call dualism, right? So, so anything physical, anything in this world that's physical is considered evil because uh, um, because it's all temporary, right? Everything is temporary. Uh, things break down, things change. Um, that's why that's why it's evil. Whereas something like truth, truth is, truth doesn't change, right? Truth is permanent. And so uh, if you kind of equate that with God, God is permanent. 
Okay, God is God is uh, uh, consistent. God doesn't change, and so therefore, you know, God would be uh, God would be good. So, why would God ever want to connect with Himself with physical humanity, physical world, which is changing, which is evil? Okay, so that's why they rejected uh, God becoming human. Uh, they possibly deny that Jesus' death atones for our sins. Um, these false teachers, they claimed special relationship with God in which they had no sin and they had special knowledge. Uh, they overemphasized the spiritual life. Uh, there was a lack of love in them, especially towards the poor and needy. Now, the interesting thing about these false teachers is they were apparently part of John's church or John's com John's community at one point. And so with this with this group leaving the church, uh, it, it caused it caused a crisis of confidence in John's uh, John's community, John's congregation. A lot of them were thinking, well, you know these these people who left, who defected, they they may have been quite influential in the church before. And so when they left, those remaining in the church uh, were put into a bit of confusion, you know, and, and then they started questioning their own their own faith. You know, is what we believe in, is it right? Is it true? Is John actually teaching us uh, the correct things or should we follow those who, who have defected? And so uh, that's why John writes this letter to affirm and to reassure his readers that that their standing before God is 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 sure, is certain. And he's he's reassuring them that everything that he's taught them is right. right. It's it's these defectors who are causing confusion. They're the ones that are wrong. So this is very much an encouragement, uh, an, an encouragement letter. Here's the structure. Now I say structure, but if you kind of look at the topics here. It's quite all over the place. Okay, there's sin, forgiveness, love, and hatred, reasons for writing, don't love the world, denying the sun, sin and being God's children, love and hatred, again, denying the incarnation, loving one another, loving God, believing Jesus. Uh, if you read First John, it's 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 all over the place, uh, and um, it almost seems like. John wrote this uh, kind of last minute. You know, he jumps from topic to topic. He goes back and forth quite a lot. So there's actually not a not a very nice structure for First John. Now the reason why is I think because all this stuff was going on in the church, uh, he had to write a very urgent letter. He had to write it very quickly. And so I think he's just kind of writing everything that just comes to his mind. And that's why he jumps uh, all over the place in terms of, uh, of, of topics, because you know, he had to get this letter to them really, really quickly. It's very different. Uh, it's very different from the Gospel of John, right? Same author. Gospel of John is, is, is a very thoughtful piece of, uh, piece of work. This one is, is the complete opposite. All right from uh, from the Gospel of John, so just keep that in mind that you know John was probably writing uh, as as a matter of urgency uh, to his church, and so he didn't have the time or space to be able to kind of craft something you know nice and neat for us or for his church and for us to read. All right, Second John. Second John is addressed to a local community. Uh, the false teachers who had early, earlier defected from one community, uh, they wanted to. They're wanting to infiltrate others. They want to uh, to bring their their teachings, bring their uh, beliefs into um, into another community. So. Uh, yeah, John is uh, intending to visit soon. 
this uh, the community. And so he has three concerns, basically, to walk in love. Okay? Love is a very important theme in, in these letters of John. Uh, watch out for the false teachers who, who deny the incarnation and then have nothing to do with such people. Okay, so this this is a very kind of straightforward, uh, simple uh, letter uh, by John. And then Third John is uh, it's it's an even it's another another short letter by John. Uh, this one is uh, slightly different. Now you kind of have to think. Okay, imagine. Now the the beginning of the church. Uh, probably had a, a committee of elders under the headship of the founding apostle. So whoever was that was, uh, in this case, it was John. Okay, so this is kind of how how churches might start, and uh, and and that's fine as long as the apostles were around. But uh, we have to understand that the apostles would know they weren't going to be in those churches forever. Right? Time will pass, and eventually the apostles will pass. Right? Uh, they will pass. Um, now, all almost all of them were actually were uh, were martyred uh, in 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 some way. So, with the apostles passing, how do the churches continue? Right, someone has to take on uh, the leadership mantle, and so in each church, uh, at some point with the apostles passing, uh, a single leader would usually emerge with the eldership under him which means that these apostles would have been training <clears throat> people within the church uh, to carry on the ministry of the church now third john is a personal letter to gaius someone named gaius about someone else named diotrephes now diotrephes is seeking this position of authority and so he actually opposes John's authority. He rejects John's letter and he slanders John. Okay. So not a good start if he if he wants to be a leader, right? To uh, to slander the founding apostle. <laughs> so um uh Diotrephes refuses to welcome uh the brothers and he forces others uh to do uh, to do the same, okay. Now, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what the brothers are. Uh, I have to read through this letter once again. Uh, I think it might have to do with uh, something of like uh, John's entourage or something. Okay. So, uh, but anyways, this Diotrephes, uh, bad news. He's he shouldn't be uh, in leadership there. So that's that's what this letter is about. Uh, and then we come to Jude. Now Jude is the brother uh, of James. This is uh, one of the Jameses, um, the brother of Jesus, son of Alphaeus, or it could be the son of Zebedee. Okay, both are named James. Uh, scholars likely think it's uh, it's Jesus, uh, Jesus' brother, uh, the first one. Now, there's a bit of uh, controversy, a bit of hesitation uh, to include this particular letter into the New Testament because um, this, uh, because Jude actually uh, uses what we call uh, pseudographical writings. Okay, so pseudographical writings uh, just means writings that are meant to look biblical. Uh, and it looks like it's written by someone prominent, but it's actually written by someone else who's pretending to be that. Okay, does that make sense? So, so we call those writings pseudographical. They, they're, they're rich. So, for example, there's a letter that comes in uh, saying from Paul, and then, you know, and then it has all this, all this other stuff. Uh, if I wrote that under the name of Paul, claiming that is that's actually Paul, then that letter would be considered pseudographical. Okay, so it's meant to look biblical, 
it claims to be from a, a particular author, but it's actually not. It's it's a it's a fake in a sense. Okay. So Jude actually uses these uh, these pseudographical writings. Um, it, uh, he references Michael uh, and Satan. So Michael the angel, archangel, and Satan disputing over Moses' body. Now this is a legend from uh, from writings in around AD twenty. And then he uh, also references uh, the prophecy of Enoch, which is uh, a writing from around 150 AD. Okay, so what do we make of an author using, or an, an inspired author using non-inspired material, meaning events that didn't happen? Is is that really a problem? So, the, the early people who were disputing about, you know, uh, trying to put together what is to, to be included in the New Testament canon, some people found that yes, that is a problem, right? Because you know, what what why are these pseudographical writings be a uh, part of part of this letter? But if you really think about it, it's not really a problem. Because uh, you know, if we consider that the, the usage of you know we of similar stories that that we might use uh, like fiction, uh, legends, you know, myths, those kind of stuff, if we use those to illustrate a point, right? So sometimes in a sermon, I might reference um, I don't know something like a nursery rhyme or Winnie the Pooh or you know, Harry Potter, or, you know, something like that. Those things aren't uh, actual events, but if I, you know, if I if I use them to illustrate a point, um, they may it might be helpful because you know this this is stuff that you know maybe the current generation understands. Okay, so uh, using fiction to illustrate a point is it's it's not it, it doesn't necessarily mean that I agree that these this stuff. These, these stories actually happened. I'm just using them to illustrate a point. That's that's all it is. So I think, so it's not really a problem uh, for, for Jude uh, to do that. Okay. So what do we have in Jude? Well, there's a warning against uh, certain men who have infiltrated the community. Uh, Judah saying that well, there's there's no need to mention their theology because their behavior is evidence uh, enough. Uh, these persons cannot be genuine when their lives deny Christ and contending for the faith means rejecting false uh, false brothers whose lives do not reflect uh, Christ. I think what this uh, what this an important point that Jude makes is the importance of how we live our lives. You know, we could say a lot of things about Jesus Christ, about what we believe, about how how to live, but if our lives uh, are, are not reflecting that, right? If if we're if we're just still engaged in in sinful behavior, uh, no one's going to take our message seriously. Right? So it's important that what we say and how we live, they line up together. Okay. So for Jude, the message is, you know, be wary of, of the teaching of those whose lives do not reflect Christ. Uh, wrong theology will often be evident in uh, bad ethics. And I would add to that uh, mistaken theology or theology that you don't actually believe. Right. So you could still have right theology, but if you're, uh, if it hasn't, if it doesn't, uh, if you don't have it, if you don't take it into your heart, right, and allow uh, that theology to to transform you to look more like Christ, um, then you will, uh, you will, uh, it will lead to uh, to bad behavior. Bad ethics, right? 
And then uh, the other thing in Jude is one of the signs of the last days is a false teaching and those who by their lives deny Christ. Okay, um, so these these few letters, uh, you know, we, we we've kind of gone through them quite, you know, relatively quickly. Then they're they're uh, they're they're quite short. I want to spend the rest of uh, of the time uh, tonight here looking at Revelation, uh, which is a very interesting book. Now, uh, Revelation. It's usually seen as a, a difficult book to read uh, and or interpret. Uh, a lot of us, maybe when we come to Revelation, we have no idea what to do with it, right? There are a few images in there that that are quite nice, right? You know, all all, all the the uh, the the kings and the tribes and all the nations bowing down to Jesus Christ, you know, that that's that's a nice image. Um uh what else is there? There's there's you know an image of of heaven and this you know the, the at the end of uh of Revelation that's all nice. Uh we have the 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 letters to the seven churches at the beginning. Right, uh, that can be a sermon series. You know, we can learn from that. You know, so there's a few things that 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 we can engage with in Revelation. But what do we do with all the other stuff? <laughs> what do we do with 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 all the all the um? You know, there, there's 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 martyrs there. There's dragons. There's beasts. There's uh, yeah, diff really weird stuff. In there to be honest so it, it, it's kind of a mixed bag uh revelation so i want to try to kind of look into that a little bit uh tonight now with revelation usually people can't kind of come to revelation with a, with a certain a certain uh perspective Right. We know Revelation, you know, maybe we've heard about Revelation it has to it has to do with something about the future. Um, but there, there have been different ways to um to interpret Revelation. So I'm just gonna to to I'm just gonna introduce you to a few of these uh these ways. Uh don't worry too much if you don't completely understand what 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 I mean here. Uh, some of you might understand, but um, don't worry about it if you if you don't. You can you can look in in the notes uh, uh, in, in your notes a little bit later if you want a bit more a uh, bit more information or you want to study it a bit more. So the first view, the first perspective is uh, the preterist view, and what this says uh, basically is everything in Revelation is in the past. Okay, it's it's it's. It talking about things in the past and has been all fulfilled. Okay, so this this is the uh, the Preterist view. Now the advantage of the Preterist view is that it's relevant to the first century audience. Okay, we take that seriously. Right, this is a letter written in the first century, and you know it's 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 for them. So it's in the past. Okay. So, so that's important. The disadvantage of the Preacher's view is that this this complete overthrow of Satan uh, uh, sorry, of, of Satan and the defeat of kingdoms of the kingdoms of evil, uh, it hasn't happened yet. right We still see uh, evil happening in this world. So that hasn't been dealt with. Right, so that's that's the the weakness of the Preacher's view. Another view is the historicist view. Um, this view is a forecast of history, from John's time to the present. Okay, so yeah, so so all of history up to the present, or from, sorry, from John from the first century to the present. 
Okay, uh, this this is the context in which revelation takes place. Now, usually that history has to do with Western Europe. Okay. The advantage is um, that it sees God's sovereign hand in history. The disadvantage is that um, every generation that's uh, of the hist of the historicist view tries to figure out who the bad guy is in their generation. Okay, so throughout history, the bad guy just keeps changing. Uh, it's a little bit too subjective, and um, you know, just focusing on uh, on Western Europe is a, is a bit narrow. Uh, especially, you know, we've got such a big world. Okay. And besides, Israel is not part of Western Europe. <laughs> right. The uh, first, you know, Palestine is not part of, uh, of of Western Europe. So that's the historicist view. The futurist view. Uh, church and Israel are separate. And then they've got this thing about the rapture of the church and Christ's millennial reign. Now, this is this is where, uh, if you've heard of you know premillennialism, mid uh, uh, was it mid or a millennialism, post millennialism, uh, all of this is part of the futurist futurist view. So it has something to do with you know, the future, okay? things that are still yet to happen in the future. Uh, the advantage of this is it recognizes uh, what must come to pass. It sees a chronological progression, and it tries to treat uh, Revelation as naturally as possible. Okay. The disadvantage, however, is um, this kind of literature, the Revelation, the, the genre of, of, of Revelation, this type of liter literature isn't always linear. You know, it doesn't always go you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It, it, it doesn't always kind of work out that way. Um, the last days are solely in the future. That's how they would interpret the, that phrase, last days, whereas uh, New Testament theology uh, says that the last days are actually now. Okay. And uh, finally, it, it, it doesn't uh, take seriously that it's a letter. Okay. It only, it only, it, 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 it just treats uh, revelation as prophecy if something happened in, in the future whereas we have to understand that this is actually a letter that uh, that John writes to his audience in the first century so if everything in revelation has to do with the future then this letter would actually be quite irrelevant to people in the first century Right, so that's the futurist view. Then we have the idealist. Okay, the idealist um, uh, is basically looks at the, the symbolism of how God acts through history. Uh, there's an ageless struggle, eternal struggle between good and evil. There's principles of uh, grace and judgment. Now, the advantage of this is that, is that it, it appreciates the book's symbolism. Okay. So Revelation, this type of writing has a lot of symbolism. So it, it, it appreciates that, it recognizes that. Disadvantage, it rejects universal fulfillment in time, okay? So an idealist wouldn't see that, you know, that uh, Revelation would necessarily be fulfilled at any time. It just, it would just think that this is, this is what's gonna happen, continue to happen uh, forever. So, which is best? Uh, probably a little bit of all of them. Okay. Now, my own view uh, is, um, in a sense, yeah, a little bit of 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 everyone of 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 all these uh, these perspectives. Uh, my own view is is that this is kind of a. Uh, a telling of what is going on behind the scenes in, in every generation. So if that makes sense, okay?
So Revelation, uh, what we're getting is kind of this opening of the curtains that throughout history, with every every um, event of persecution, uh, of you know, holiness, God, goodness, the church struggling with evil, struggling with um, any anything anti-God, Revelation is telling us what is happening behind the scenes. So uh, in, in one sense, it's relevant to every generation, to every point in history uh, and into the future. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there there will be uh, a, a a final day when uh, when when Christ comes back and everything is um, is renewed, and you know we we will live in kind of new new heaven, new earth. Okay, so that's a little bit of uh, my own view. Now I mentioned genres. Uh, earlier so the revelation actually uh it actually falls under three categories of genres okay first of all it is in a it's apocalyptic so this type of writing has a lot of symbolism it divides time into eras it's intended to be uh, an encouragement to those who are faithful and uh, it reveals to the reader what is going on behind uh, behind the curtains in a sense Okay, so if you so kind of imagine, you know, if you go watch uh, a musical or if you go watch a play, you know, all you see is kind of the stage and the actors and actresses and dancers and singers. You, you, you know, you see that as an audience. But if you were to one day kind of, uh, you know, at the end of the show, walk up to the front, get onto the stage, walk behind the stage, you'll see a whole bunch of different things happening. You know, you have there. There's a costume department. There's you know, all these levers to, that you pull. There's all these uh, structures in the back. So there's a lot of things happening behind in order to make what's happening in front happen. Okay. So Revelation is 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 this walk, uh, walking behind the curtains, behind the stage. So that's that's uh, that's what the apocalyptic genre is, uh, and then the second genre we have to uh, we have to understand is it's prophecy. Okay. Now prophecy, uh, we we might think of prophecy as something happening in the future. That that's part of prophecy, but very often prophecy is also concerned with with what's happening now. Okay. So if you if if you look at uh, if you happen to study any, any of the prophets in the Old Testament, a lot of what they speak about, what the prophets speak about, is actually what's happening in Israel at the current time. Uh, some of it has to do with the future, but much of it, much of their words have to do with what's happening now. Okay. So that's the second genre. And then the, the, the third genre I mentioned already is that this is a letter. Right. There's a purpose for writing. Um, it addresses specific needs. Um, so John was writing to the seven churches. And so it has to be something that these seven churches are, uh, they understand and they know and uh, they, they find relevant to themselves. So as an apocalyptic, uh, Revelation speaks to the suffering Believers, it uses symbolism and imagery to encourage the faithful by speaking about the ultimate realities of salvation and judgment. Um, so, essentially, John is saying, you know, this is what's this is what's happening behind the scenes. In the end, God wins. Okay, so he's he's encouraging them. He says, yes, there is a battle right now. The persecution you're facing right now is part of that battle between God and evil. But in the end, God will win. Okay, so apocalyptic. Uh, and then as a prophecy, the word of the Spirit is direct to the present circumstances of God's people. And then as a letter, it addresses the specific situation of the churches addressed. Okay, so we just have to keep in mind uh, that, that Revelation is falls under three, uh, three genres. 
Now, how do we uh, how do we read this book? Um, so just let me check my notes here. Okay, so uh, Revelation is written in a way that the original readers would understand. So it's relevant to them during uh, Roman persecution. Uh, there's a lot of Old Testament theology uh, in uh, in Revelation. So I would suggest if you really want to understand Revelation, really try to get to understand uh, the Old Testament. Okay, that's that's the background. Uh, visions should be seen as wholes, okay, meaning meaning a, a whole vision rather than just you know parts of a vision. We should read them as a whole. Uh, don't be con too concerned with details, unless John is uh, concerned with the details. Okay, some details are, are are minor. If John doesn't really make a big deal of it, perhaps we shouldn't make too big a deal of it. Okay. And then uh, symbolism is key, right? We have to we have to understand that there is symbolism. Uh, it uses Roman culture, Jewish culture, biblical images. Uh, for example, uh, when it talks about Babylon, uh, you know, Babylon is something in the Old Testament, you know, uh, that brought the the Israelites into exile, and so Babylon represents the current power, which is Rome, right? Uh, there are some mentions of horses. Horses represent power, authority. Uh, there you, there you, there's color as well, white, which symbolizes holiness, red, symbolizes wickedness or warfare or adultery. There's the uh, the great dragon, uh, Satan. Okay, Satan is represented there, symbolized there as well. And uh, so we get to the, the the structure, which is kind of what I, what I want to um, I want to go through a little bit here. So we start off with the introduction. There's a prologue, contest, and then there's the church in the world, which is uh, the seven churches that John writes to. So why seven? Seven is a symbolic number. Seven represents uh, fullness or wholeness, right? So writing to seven churches. Uh, John is addressing all the churches uh, at the time, and I would argue he was he's addressing all the churches throughout history as well. So, uh, so it's relevant to us. This letter is relevant to the church today. Then we get uh, what I would call panel one. Okay, so in panel one, this is from uh, chapters four to the beginning of eight. We get a throne in heaven. Is the authority of the Lamb. There's a book with seven seals. So there's seven again. Okay. Uh, seven seals uh, talks about the glory and splendor of the heavenly throne room. There's a slain Lamb uh, worthy to open the scroll. And then with, there's six seals of judgment. Okay. Or scrolls, I guess. Six seals of judgment for the nations of the world. So the first four seals have to do with Rome's promise of peace, and uh, it that will that ends in death. Seals five and six have to do with martyrdom. Uh, kings cannot avoid destruction; they will be destroyed as well. And then, after seal six is opened, there's a break. And in the midst of that break, uh, it mentions that God's people will be saved. Uh, there's a symbolic four, um, 144 thousand people saved now just an interesting side note uh if you've ever had any conversation with um like uh, jehovah's witnesses they they tend to believe that uh, they tend to take this number as as a literal 144 thousand so only 144 thousand people throughout history will uh will be brought into heaven the rest will kind of uh remain you know still in a good place but you know, there's only 144,000. So I think uh, in the Jehovah's Witness theology, you know, you work hard enough, and you will be able to make it into the 144,000. I mean, think about it throughout history. There's 144 is not a lot of people. Okay? There's a very very slim chance you'll make it. 
But uh, remember, this is apocalyptic. It's symbol. It's symbolic. One hundred forty-four thousand. Uh, there are twelve tribes. Okay, twelve thousand per tribe. Twelve is a number of completion. A thousand represents God's control uh, during an unknown length of time. So if you remember that uh, in 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 Psalms and Second Peter, you know, for God a day is like a thousand years. A thousand. Uh, what was it? Yeah, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day for God, right? So, so God's control during an unknown length of time. So, twelve thousand. Uh, sorry, twelve times one thousand, and then you add up twelve tribes of uh, twelve tribes. Uh, works up to one hundred forty-four. Twelve times twelve thousand. Yeah, one hundred forty-four thousand. And then we get, uh, and then the seal seven is opened, and we get the silence in heaven, leading to this final climax, as um, as the people of God pray. And that's uh, that's eight one. Now, this kind of silence and final climax, you kind of think when you read it, you kind of think, oh, okay. It's this is actually it sounds like a good place to end. Right? There's judgment and then there's kind of this quiet, this peace, things are all right in chapter eight. And so you think this is a good place to end. But then no, then we get panel two. Uh eight um chapter eight, verse six up to eleven. And this is the seven trumpets trumpets of judgment so just when you think there's peace there's there's this quietness everything's settled we get seven trumpets of judgment so trumpets one to four uh, uh echoes or similar to the exodus plagues and then trumpets five and six there's the uh this is roman fear of barbarians and others um and then we get a break again after six and we have this little angel with the little scroll, uh, and he talks about you know it's a future glory, but present suffering. Okay, so even though you're suffering now, uh, it won't last. There, you will have future glory. Uh, these witnesses are killed by the beast, but they follow Jesus to resurrection. And then we get trumpet seven, where God's temple in heaven in the heavens uh, is opened. There's the Ark and the Covenant leading to, uh, to uh, destruction of evil. Okay, so after Trumpet Seven, again, things like it sounds like things have, uh, things have settled, right? This is, it sounds like a, another good place to end. But then we get Panel Three. Now, panel three is a little bit different. We have this deeper conflict between the church, uh, the dragon, which represents Satan, and his minion. So this is between chapters 12 to 14. Now, this is uh, what, you, what you might call the center of Revelation. It uh, provides kind of the theological and historical reasons for, for what John's readers are experiencing. So this is the why. Okay. So, um, yeah, it shows it shows the history of Satan versus God's uh, people. Satan is defeated by the woman's child and is now cast down to wage war through Rome uh, on the saints. Yeah, so so yeah, it just kind of looks back on on Jesus Christ. And why Satan, uh, why Satan is is waging war? Then we get in chapter thirteen these two beasts that come up uh, from the sea and from the earth. Uh, from the sea represents kind of the power of Rome and its emperors. Uh, from the earth is a a parody of the Lamb. So at the beginning of Revelation we have this this we have this Lamb and then uh, the, the slain Lamb representing Jesus Christ and here. We get this, uh, this, this, this not quite the same lamb. 
Okay. Then there's a false prophet and his anti sign. Okay, 666. Um, why 666? Well, if we think about, uh, again, symbolism and numbers, uh, uh, seven is the number of completion, right? God made the world in seven days uh, and that kind of thing. So if seven is completion, six might be considered not quite complete, right? It, it looks good, but it you know it it's 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 perverted in a way because it's not complete. So uh, that's how I would understand six six six. And there's just three of them. Again, three has to do with uh, with with um, you know you think of the Trinity, that kind of thing <clears throat> of you know, completion, fullness. So if seven 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 is would be something like you know God uh, the complete number six 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 would be well you know not quite complete not quite complete not quite complete okay? there's some uh, I don't know what the word is incompleteness perversion not quite to the standard of God okay so that's how I would <clears throat> I would understand six 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 so that would be the the mark of uh, of the beast the the anti sign of uh, of the beast. <clears throat> okay, then we get one hundred forty four thousand who remain faithful. Uh, they must continue to bear witness, and they defeat the beast by giving up their lives, right? By not loving their lives, and they're willing to be sacrificed. And then we have the wine press of God's wrath. This is judgment on the wicked in chapter fourteen. Okay, so we have this, this center. And then panel four, where we get another seven something of wrath. So if you remember panel one and two, panel one, we had this uh, these seven seals uh, of judgment. <clears throat> uh, and then panel two, seven trumpets of judgment. Here, panel four, we get seven bowls of wrath. And this is uh, God's increasing judgment on Rome and her kings and the ultimate image of doom. We have the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> okay, and then we have panel five. And this is the final judgments. And we have this these kind of two cities. So we have this uh, the prostitute city, Babylon. Um, representing Rome, seducing the nations and drunk on the blood of the saints. Uh, so judgment on the prostitute city, uh, judgment on the beast and the armies of the earth. Okay, so we have the true white rider against Rome's fake riders uh, from chapter six. Then there's the, the millennium. This is after Rome's destruction. Still not over. Uh, only God knows when that millennium will end, but Satan has been bound in, and is awaiting his final uh, destruction. But the gospel will go forward, and if we die, then we reign with Christ. And then it ends with uh, the new Jerusalem and the garden. Okay. And, then, and then at the end, we have the church finally in glory. Uh, the splendor of New Jerusalem, the river of life <clears throat> in New Eden. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, there's the epilogue in chapter 22. Now, what is going on in Revelation? Uh, this is my suggestion. Uh, so remember I, I mentioned earlier that uh, apocalyptics uh, genres, uh, they're, they don't really necessarily happen linearly, okay, from like, you know, in order. Uh, if we were re to read it linearly, we would actually have 21 instances of judgment, right? We'd have the, the seven seals, and then there'll be a break, and then there'll be another seven uh, uh, 
another seven judgments, you know, the trumpets, and then another seven judgments, which are the bulls. Um, if we were to read it linearly, that's that's what would happen. But what we get in in the sevens, uh, so panel one, two, and four, uh, my suggestion is that it's not a sequence of 21 things, okay? Because each of these panels, one, two, and four, each of these has an ending where the, the people of God, the saints, they're, they're victorious and evil is, is destroyed, okay? But then after panel one, it seems that we kind of it, it kind of restarts. It restarts, uh, and then we get the seven trumpets, and then there's a break, and then in panel four again it restarts for another another set of of judgments. So my suggestion is to see that these see panels one, two, and four. Uh, these three sets of sevens as a repetition. All three panels are telling the same thing. Okay. Uh, the only difference is that as we move from panel one to two to four, the repetition gets increasingly intense. Okay. Things are getting more intense. So panel one shows the events and judgment God's ultimate victory from one perspective. Then we go to get to panel two. It does the same thing, but there's more intensity, and perhaps you can you can say it's from a diff, another a second perspective. And then panel four again does this with even more intensity. Okay, but they're all the repetitions of the same thing of uh, of the same theme that there is a battle between God and evil, with God ultimately winning at the end so with all of these panels um all of these points to panel three which i mentioned is the center of the book okay and uh this communicates the entire cosmic and theological history uh in in kind of a fantasy type of a vision right and so someone reading the book of revelation uh, you know, with all these stuff going on, they would, um, what John is telling them is to pay attention to the center, pay attention to what is happening in panel three, and be encouraged uh, by that. Okay. And then we have at the end of Revelation, uh, I'll just kind of end with these words. Uh, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come and whoever wishes. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. This is Revelation 22, 17. So John is saying that um, the invitation is to know Christ and to await his coming because he is coming soon. And the final words of Jesus uh, that we have is, I am coming soon. Okay. So I think we as Christians and the church throughout history need to keep that perspective that uh, Christ is coming soon. And so we need to be ready uh, for whenever that time is. Okay. I think we're going to stop the recording.